Hello and welcome to the 109th episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Thursday the 16th of January 2020 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. This week we have part two of our discussion with fellow Emancipation Network comrade Grant from Swanside Chats and his friend David Rylance on Gary Teeple's excellent book Marx's Critique of Politics. The third and final part has been released in the next few days as a Patreon-only episode, so if that piques your critique, why not sign up as a Patreon for only $5 a month, or less than $1 an episode? Just this very day we reached the magic 100 Patrons, so now I'll be doing two Patreon-only episodes every month. This week I have the new Patreons Luke, Paul Goldrick Kelly, and Stephen Del Corso to thank. I also have the new editor Stevie Schmidt to give a shout out to. Thanks a million Stevie. And of course to my main man Mason who does some really sterling editing work too. If you'd like to help out with editing or producing the show please hit me up on Twitter or Facebook. And of course you can always leave a nice review on iTunes or your podcatcher of choice. Let's join the discussion. I don't know, like, I'd have to come, I'd, I'd disagree somewhat there. Let's not make out Boris as, a, as, a, as an amazing strategist. I, I, well, I think, he, I think he understood. I have a more materialist concept of, of why Brexit is happening, because I think it's to do with a very low rate of profit on capital in the UK, way lower than the rest of the, of, it's the lowest in the developed world. So Brexit has been laid as a, as a kind of a tool whereby you can radically alter the trading conditions in England to basically reduce the cost of living by changing your, your trade laws, which the Tories constantly talk about. But I do agree with you. Boris saw the writing on the wall, and I think you're right why the, the Tories got to bounce socially. But um, I, I, I think that seeing Brexit purely in this, in a, in a, in a political sense, negates the reasoning for why the right wants Brexit and has incubated Brexit as essentially the British Tea Party. Well, I guess the thing is, though, uh, I, I'm not actually sure that the right wants Brexit. And I think the the proof of that will be in the pudding of what actually Boris delivers in terms of the deal that he strikes with the EU and how much it, it, it actually isn't all that different from the conditions which existed prior to so I mean, effectively in some sense rendering the whole quit like the whole thing about why did we leave like something of a question mark like i guess the thing is that uh, i think uh, two things stand to mind one is in terms of the right the right fixated in some sense on euro skepticism as a means to try and when well, it was adrift as the the cold war ended and euro skepticism provided a kind of a new foundation stone for defining its identity and, but the thing about this, like most culture war stuff of this kind, uh, it wasn't really meant to actually be resolved. In it was just meant to be constantly campaigned and run on. It was re- that's why it was. You know, Cameron ran the uh, decided to make this a question that would be resolved for referendum because he wanted to crush the, the this as an internal issue within the party. Uh, he wanted to subordinate that that right. It wasn't the right that pushed it. And so it's interesting to me that when it, when that result was delivered, the immediate response from the right was what. Farage quit. <laughs> like, he basically, I mean, really, it, was, it would have been a moment, surely, where he would have had, like, maximum authority. No, he, he bailed. You know, it was like a deer in the headlights. And then same with Boris. Boris bailed. You know, like, Bar- like, both of them were actually quite mortified, I think, by what had, what had occurred. I think since then, they've, uh, I think particularly with Farage, there's been an adaptation. Like, for instance, I think Farage has kind of, like, grasped that there was an actual possibility of being able to, like, literally replace the Tories. And so I think that that, that in some sense, Farage has moved from a um, a pure unpopular populist towards something that was a much more um, ambiguously anti-political and oriented against, oriented at the very least to try and like an outright agenda of replacing the um, existing right wing of the political class. But I think that, I think that so far as the question of like it being a strategy of capital, I guess, I guess the thing is that like, I don't know if I don't really, I don't really let me put it this way, right? You you talk and you listen to the the ERG, the top people in say the ERG, like Reese Mogg and these type of guys, and they constantly talking about 
listen to their what they constantly talk about is the World Trade Organization trade deals. That's it. Like with Brexit, that's that's all they talk about. And you look at who their favorite economist is, is this guy called Patrick Minford, right wing economist. And he stood in front of the one of the parliamentary committees and he said, well, Yes. Now, this is just like straight from <laughs> this is like just falling rate of profit shit. He goes, yes, well, we will, uh, of course, have to deindustrialize further, get rid of our car plants and we'll have to get we won't have cap. We won't have common agricultural policies. We'll get in cheap beef from Argentina and Australia and uh, America and we will let the all the farmers go to shit. But, you know, it'll be cheaper to feed the working class and, you know, we'll deregulate the city. And that's their model is like just another step down, you know, that's explicitly there. That's explicitly what they say, you know. I mean, sure, sure. Exactly. Um, um, it's the thing is, I'm not really surprised by that in the sense that, of course, that the the right would pursue or having given having to deal with what is going, basically having to deal now with, the, with with this as a fact. There's a sense in which, of course, they're going to try and pursue the most right wing, economically rationalist kind of uh, plundering that they could achieve out of the situation. I guess the thing that's interesting to me is that when May ran um, in the election, one of the biggest things that made the difference between her running and Boris in many respects was outside of the fact that she was running for a mandate on Brexit, but then because of the actual nature of the deal was in some ways totally, was like it was pretty much countermanding <laughs> Brexit. They couldn't talk about it through the whole election, much like it put, it in a similar situ- put them in a similar situation to what Corbyn was in in this election, which is that... The election was about Brexit, but we're not going to talk about it. Sorry, you know, the the situation was so basically with the Tories that they, they openly campaigned on delivering Brexit with Toryism. So you weren't just voting; going to be voting for breakfast, Brexit, breakfast. You're going to be just voting for Brexit. You're going to be voting for a Tory Brexit. Well, that was completely rejected. And the thing about it with 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 Johnson, maybe maybe this is maybe they'll, they'll try it on. I'm not saying that they won't necessarily try it on, but I guess what I mean is that if they do. I suspect that the response that they get will not be like that they will move from strength to strength and be able to pursue a coherent strategy that provides an accumulation pathway for capital. Instead, much like we saw in the US when the Republicans managed to grab the Senate and the House and had the presidency, it's going to be it would be it would actually they'll fall apart internally in a way which will actually look kind of mysterious. Like why, for example, you, you, you'll wonder why are they falling apart internally? Like they are technically in a, in a position or a, of mass ascension. It's partly to do with the fact that the only reason that they're in that position is because they have a totally different at, at the electoral level. They have a totally different social, like they the the social composition of their electoral vote is completely different from what Tories usually. Uh, receive and so I guess the thing is is that if it's from if in terms of a whole a lot of questions arise for individual members of the political class then about self-preservation of their own position and then because in the past there was much more capacity to impose discipline on individual members and in terms of so they had to subordinate their own political self-interest in relation to say their electorate to the overall agenda of the party well increasingly I think that with the and what tended to be the main disciplinary force of that too was the social basis that the parties had. It meant that all these, all these kind of like splits and ideological differences that, and everyone, every individual thinking they had the secret elixir that was going to take the party from, you know, from, or was going to, you know, like launch a new period of of political greatness, quote unquote, like, like you know, would be the new Reagan, the new Thatcher. It's what held that into place or what like prevented all these sort of like fractious ideological differences from and personal interest pursuits from breaking out was the, 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 the sheer discipline of not just their own social base, but the social base they were fighting against. So in a sense, I'll put it this, I'll put it this way, that the actual collapse of labor might look like it's free reign for them now. But I actually feel like it's much more likely that they're without having... I mean, and in the most clearest sense, without having this social base that provided an external pressure upon them to have to fall into line with one another, there's only actually more room for weakness and chaos if if they were to pursue classic Tory ideological agenda, goals and aims. 
I mean, I think that, I mean, basically, I mean, the one thing about this is it's testable. We'll see. We'll see basically on what, in terms of what happens. Um, well, I would, I would disagree with you there because, like, I think if you went back and you asked Thatcher in 1980, 1979 or 1980 and you said, right, would you take 15 years of being a Tory, or 17 years of Tory government and then being out of power for, like, 15 years to, like, totally redesign the economy? She'd go, yes, please. And I think with a majority like Boris has, he will, they will go to try and do what they want with that large majority. It, because with a large majority like that, it operates, I think, differently than the states seem to be. Senators and House of Representatives seems to be a lot more free to change their minds than in the system in, in the UK or seem to have more tendency to go rogue. But like, I think you will see maybe not this, maybe they'll get, Boris will get elected again a second time. But as effects of like, like look at the effects of what NAFTA did to the Democratic Party. The effects of NAFTA are still felt today in the Democratic Party. So I, I expect like if they do the Brexit, those effects will be 20, 30 year effects minimum. I, I, certainly, I, I think that uh, there's no doubt that the Tories are going to experience, like, this has not been a positive vote, an overwhelming and positive endorsement of Toryism. There's absolutely no sense in which that's been the case. If anything, it's only basically an endorsement of, of Boris looking like he's taken command of the Tories to and suppressed the political class interests that have been wanting to stifle and smother Brexit, which I think fundamentally is why I'm a I would put question marks over this this idea that it's a materialist, uh, sorry, like this materialist, a claim that it's a materialist argument that there's a, a capital accumulation strategy like behind this because most of the, the majority of the Tories were against it and remained invested in smothering it. And so I guess the, the thing is, is that what's, what, I guess what strikes me is that I, I fully suspect that the majority that they've got now it's just going to erode and like the collapse. But the only the only possible asterisks like above that being that there has to be a vehicle, you know, to re- replace that majority with. So, and I mean, whether it, I mean, I, at this point, I don't really think it's going to be the Labour Party bouncing back. But there would there would it's interesting because it actually creates a void into which maybe something now actually will step. But whatever the case, I think that. that Although the, the the majority looks like stunning, it looks like a stunning majority that could just be, as I said, it's the sense it gives them free reign. But to me, I guess in some sense, the very fact the majority is so big, actually, only creates more room for internal clashes and fights and refusing, basically, and trying to hold the party hostage to certain factional interests within it. Because basically, with such a large majority, it actually kind of creates freedom to be able to pursue individual agendas within the party, I guess, or block agendas. So it's like, I mean, it's like, for instance, in the States where we saw that part of the reason that these things couldn't get passed was exactly that they weren't considered to be conservative enough by many parts of, you know, the Republican Party. And so when normally that there would be internal disciplinary power to be able to bring that right wing to, to heal. Instead, there wasn't, and, you know, the result is that nothing got passed, nothing got done. And so it's sort of like, I don't know, I mean, it's hard to say, but I just, I guess that uh, to me it strikes me that um, unless Boris is going to pursue something that looks a lot different from what Toryism has looked like, that it won't go well for him, that's all. And actually, it'll, it'll end up being a very weak government, despite the fact that it seems to have only, there's only reason at the moment to seem to think that it's going to be inherently powerful and able to do what it wants, you know, in an untrammeled free way. Yeah, I, I actually appreciate, uh, Tom, that, that this political economy oriented explanation uh, for Brexit is oriented away from attempting the kind of usual political fetishizing interpretation. What, what I'd reference, I think, in the Teeple book, uh, in Marx himself, is that the alienation of the political sphere is a material alienation itself. It's a real abstraction. So there would be reasons that actually are politically internal for the behavior of the political class around X, Y, and Z. And I would also say that I, I think it's – it almost reminds me of those debates. Not This isn't to you know 
go full leftoid and and compare Johnson to Hitler or Brexit to Nazism or something like that. But but I think it reminds me of the debates about oh how much did the capitalists support. Hitler, right? Because there were people in the capitalist class who benefited from Nazi rule, and there were people who were suppressed by it, right? And so the thing is, the capitalist capitalist civil society is actually chaotic. You know, that's one of the reasons you need a political state. And the capitalist class, you know, one fraction of it will benefit from Brexit. One fraction really wanted remain, you know? And I would even say probably a majority of UK interests we're into the international trade benefits of being in the European Union. And so it's, it's you know, if we look at it that way. I don't know. Yeah, go ahead, Tom. I, I know. I, under, I understand your, I understand, like, because I make this exact point when it comes to, say, like, Thatcher and the 70s in, in England and the 80s. Like, you had sectors of capital that lost their fucking minds over what Thatcher was doing. I remember seeing this, this like, industrialist in Manchester and he was like, they'd taken the monetarist turn and they sent the interest rates up to like, you know, 17% or something. And he was going, he was like standing in front of his factory. He was like going, these interest rates, they're killing me. You know, literally, I will have to shut down my business. Well, I mean, and, and the, the eradication of unions. I mean, I'm sure there were plenty of bosses who, who were going, that's my HR firm. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? So it was like the actual neoliberal turn was... It's not like it was a, like people talk about this Mont Pelerin society stuff, right? But like, you know, that is, is trying to make it out that there's like this, this great grand, grand thing. But really, a lot of the time it was like capital stumbling through itself with different st- strategies. And I found one that it kind of some parts of it committed to and they pushed it through and it, it, it worked for a while for them. And I feel like that the Brexit is an expression of something. Like, I think it's an expression like you, you look at, say, now in the Brexit moment, right? There was two essential economic models that the capitalist class had to choose from. They had this idea of the Brexit one. They can't stay at the same place because the politics won't allow it. Right. So they have they have Brexit or they have a return to a heavily state kind of whatever you want to call it. Sock them thing where the state is a massive actor like Corbyn wanted to do. And the capitalist class, whatever, we 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 got to look at like the different parties. So they split their, even though they received more of the vote, anti-Brexit people received 53% in this election. Okay. But the their politics of it shows that they, they actually, the capitalist class universally went against Corbyn, universally ran Labour or Lib Dems as a, as a split one. And the Tory party showed up and it's gone after a certain particular strategy, you know. And I, I think in these in these instances, it's not like capital is one big, you know, uh, homogeneous lump. You're right. It's, it's different factions fighting. But like in certain instances, the capitalist class may have to choose between a thing that, you know, will actually hurt a large section of, it, of the capitalist class. Like you look at when it happened in the 70s. The profits of the financial sector in the city of London was higher, absolute in absolute terms, it was higher than all the profits from industry in the UK economy, right? That should lead you to believe why financial sector, that deindustrialization won one, because they thought we can just keep our, increase our profitability. Fuck you, capitalists. We don't care about you. In this time, these highly integrated, just in time people that are sending stuff off to industry to Germany and France and stuff like this, it's probably a much smaller section than the other parts of capital. And all of the ca- all of the capitalists, the right wing press, all back Brexit, all of them. So I, I, I feel like, I don't know, I'm a materialist. So I think we're having some kind of, like, we totally, I think, concur about the nature of the social element. But I feel when we look about what is driving, I think you guys are too political about it, I think. But, you know, this, but, and you think I'm too goddamn <laughs> crude and Marxist. So I don't know. But, like, we'll, we'll, we'll see what's in the cake. We'll find out in the next 10 years. Well, I think we could get into Marx's critique of political economy, but I, I, I yeah, I think yeah, we've gone for Brexit for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I meant though in the sense of that critical political economy is different from critique of political economy, right? And I actually don't think that you're going to be able to find in civil societies perfect answers for why things happen in politics. 
I guess. But yeah, I, I mean, hit us with a hit us with a different question. Let's like you know, pol- politics just makes people argue, right? You know, we're we're getting we're getting too damn close. <laughs> but go ahead, David. I, well, actually, no, actually, I, 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 like in terms of like, I actually don't think you're being crude, crudely economistic. I actually think that you're engaging in critical political economy still, rather than the critique of. And why I would say that is. I certainly agree with you about stumbling through when you were talking about um, Thatcher. Yeah, Thatcher and the and the the turn and the, the the turn trying things on. I absolutely agree. Yeah, I think that the so what's so what's what's treated as a kind of like ideological paradigm that was pre-formatted and pursued as a uh, as like a you know sort of a kind of like nefarious plan was much more haphazard and tried on in res- in many ways in response to international events as anything else in in terms of the changes to capitalist political economy. And I think, I guess what I'd, I'd say is that it strikes me that if the right seems like it's, if it seems like it, it, it sees a massive opportunity for itself to be able to pursue an accumulation strategy, it's the very fact that they seem to have such a clear blueprint or plan, which to me actually speaks of the way in which this is actually abstracted from the political economic conditions that Brexit represents. I think there might actually be something in what you say in terms of like Brexit being able to happen because of a, um, a particularly collapsed rate of profit in Britain. In particular, the failure of austerity in that sense, to be able to do anything, you know, to actually solve that problem may well have created a situation in which the, the effort to gain some sort of authority back over society has been now litigated within the political class through Brexit. And there certainly, I think that someone like Johnson, you know, or this actually said that some people like Rees Mogg and whatever the case might be, seem to think that it will provide a basis to pursue, um, you know, all the reactionary policies of their dreams. But I guess that it strikes me that actual fact that the political economic conditions that Brexit will produce actually will militate to a large degree against achieving what they want. I mean, we'll see in practice. We will see what depends on what happens. But uh, that would be my view, I guess. So it's not actually the case that, like, I think that it's purely the uh, purely a matter of political representational drama and... Um, Skullduggery. Yeah, I guess uh, for all intents and purposes, subjective battles between segments of the political class that will make this much more of a headache and a... Um, uh, not a clear run for them at all. But I actually think it's got a lot to do with, as Grant said, the... The fact that, that that the political is a real abstraction and the fact that society is in, interposed upon politics, something that the political class did not bank on, is trying to leverage but can only do so in some sense. And I think this is the key thing about what the sacrifice has had to be for Boris taking the road that he has. Yes, he saved the political class, but to, to, there's, been a, there's been some sort of concession granted to the relationship between what the British political class will need to look like and the pretenses it will have to uphold, I suppose, in delivering for the frame for a a post-EU Britain. And I I don't know, I sort of think to myself, like, it's hard to see it at the moment too, particularly because I think the way it emerges is not in the form necessarily of organised resistance, but seems to be much more kind of like an obscure, sort of almost secular, like degenerative process. But I, I sort of, I kind of feel like the the ways in which Boris has to either take the Tories on a new political road, or if they stick to you know this Rees Mogg direction, if you want, I, I suspect they're going to actually face. Well, I don't, I don't even necessarily think it's not even a case necessarily that they'll be able to pass what they want, and then they'll face the consequences. I, I just, I actually, I really wanted to, I really have a kind of. My lean is to think that actual fact they won't even be able to pass it. And and it will be cause and it will be bizarre because there's no reason, quote unquote, that they shouldn't be able to. Except for the fact that they actually the fact this the the very fact that they're so hollowed out, and the very fact that they actually have not only do they not have a solid political base, uh, sorry, so solid social base for their conservative agenda, but what's even worse is that their electoral base now right, to, to achieve this majority, <laughs> is actually based in a um, in large swaths and probably a majority of a social strata that the Tories have never had to really pursue their agenda in relation to. 
So it's sort of like I don't know. I I, I think that the the situation here is um, I actually think that the, the the depth of of stagnation that capital finds itself in, and the very fact that the political state is so it's so incoherent. So and because of its this relationship between society and politics. The incoherence in the political state means that it's really, really hard to solidify the usual kind of leadership where there is this force that there's the force that that's there to muddle through the coherent sort of force which tries things on and and, and works towards some kind of uh, overall strategy for capital. It's not there in the political state, really. But we'll see. We'll see what happens. We'll see. But um, let's kind of work this back to a bit of Marx. I was just thinking on the podcast, we've done this long series of Mike McNair uh, detailing, you know, looking at all the strategies that people uh, have taken. You know, the left has taken revolutionary strategies and, you know, critiquing them and trying to point towards a, a, a new strategy for the future. And one of these... One of these things that we we always end up doing, you get you pull one strand, then you 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 go back another strand, and you you end up going back, and then in the end of the day, we end up in like eighteen eighty six or something, and Lasalle and Eisenacher join together to form the SPD, and you go, yeah, that's the one there, <laughs> you know, and on on some level, when we look at the this idea of anti-politics and we say, say, say last, we're talking so much about Brexit, so let's map it onto Brexit. Like, the problem is, like, that the Labour Party came out of the society as a social movement and then went went back on that and tried to be a kind of a, a political party and, and disassociated itself. Really, from the beginning, it joined hands with the state at a very early time and didn't kind of oppose, oppose the state and stay, stay aloof from the state. Like is is it yeah is this election just like it's like the fourth step down on this long political error a political yeah but like a political error essentially we're talking about politics a lot now today it's like political error from like nineteen uh, eighteen whatever eighteen ninety four for some reason what we were saying about you know the labor party is kind of very quickly becoming a part of state institutions. It reminds me of conversations I've had with David, and I mean, this is really in the heart of the era of mass politics, right, about the SPD and about kind of even un unbeknownst to themselves by a certain point, though a lot of this stuff about, you know, the conquest of politics or, or a politics to end politics, I think is a lot of the way it was framed at the time. But a lot of this, this anti-political stuff even during the era of mass politics, was related to why workers' institutions or workers' representatives, quote-unquote, were able to storm the state to the extent that they did. And David, I mean, you, you've talked, you probably know this better than me, but I mean, it's when there's that turn, when the SPD, you know, basically signs itself up to be the slave drivers of World War I, uh, you know, using its its base in the trade unions, uh, by voting for war credits, there's a large faction of people involved in the SPD who oppose it, you know, because they had this not one penny for the state kind of initial thing. You know, I mean, imagine labor, not one penny for the state. Are you kidding? And they had this this anti-political reason that actually a lot of the people who were who were not sure about voting for war credits didn't they didn't even really know why but they had this sense that if we do this we're going to undo part of our party's reason for being it's interesting because I, I think um one of the things that has been said a criticism that's been leveled about the anti-political reading of marx is that it, you know it's that it's somehow it's it's found this sort of uh this secret reading that generations of Marxists and, and masses of intellectuals that, you know, political actors, including Lenin, etc., you know, that none, they, none of this, none of them were aware of this. And then uh, you know, they, 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 they apparently all wrong. And, you know, we've come along and we suddenly see the real buzz, right? I think this is the thing is that in actual fact, it's actually helped me understand, right, what's actually going on. Because it's, in some sense, it's lost to history, I've realised. what's I actually have I've been able to understand what the... SPD was talking about within itself a lot. For instance, they always use the, you'll find this is across the literature, they use the, the phraseology, the locution, the conquest of politics. 
not taking political power, but the conquest of politics. Lenin uses this as well. And it's the thing is that what is what, why? Why use that terminology, the conquest of politics? What does it mean to conquer politics? I mean, certainly to me, what it suggests is something that's that's militated against the political. And I think it, it goes to fundamentally too to another point, which is I think that anti-politics is often treated as being political abstentionism or apoliticism, when the whole point is that it's the active impingement upon the political. It's actually meant to be about the, it's not doing politics, it's not about participation in politics, but it's about the impingement upon it. It's like, so in other words, that the Marx himself actually savages the, in some ways, in fact, I, I, I suspect that one of the reasons why anti-politics is actually not available as a, a sort of terminology for Marx in whatever shape, form or form is because there's an, actually a part of the revolutionary left that occupies this this position under this banner. But its claim is that, and and, and it's, it's even, I can't remember the article this in Grant, but it's the one where he, it's actually the very article where he says, if this is Marxism, then I'm not a Marxist. But basically what, what Marx emphasises is that exhorting the political class to, uh, sorry, the political class, the working class to abstain from politics and to, to effectively just sort of basically withdraw into uh, civil society and I guess in some sense almost like ga- engage in a form of like a, an Amish-like reserve uh, pending the uh, social revolution that, you know, will, will kind of just, I guess, you know, arrive like a miraculous conception. Um, he is massively... Uh, he savages this position because what uh, and, and savages it most importantly as itself being engaged in the preservation and upholding of the political spirits of politics. So in that sense that you often find the left will critique a, a politicism as being politics as, as being itself political. I don't necessarily have anything. I don't necessarily disagree with that per se, although I think it kind of begs the question of, you know, about whether a politicism is actually a thing in that sense. But the thing about anti-politics, though, is it's exactly about this, just like the difference between abstaining from politics and waiting for a social revolution to arrive, effectively negates the whole point of active association that forms a social movement, in you know, the movement in society where the real movement actually organises itself. Well, similarly, right, anti-politics is actually a mediating term between political refusalism and the practice of politics. Anti-pol- and that's what the thing is, when I, like in, in grasping that, it really becomes clear what Marx... If anti-politics wasn't practicable, in some ways, there wouldn't be a horizon beyond political emancipation. And Marx is so... It's just so clear that political in- emancipation is insufficient. And it's always read as being, oh, but what he's talking about is, you know, economic emancipation, effectively. But it's that's not a, that's not really the thing that he's saying at all, because political emancipation, in and of itself, right, encompasses economy. So what Marx is really saying is that the social relation to, to production, it's it's the it's the emancipation from that, which, in the case of capitalism, involves the perfection, as T. Paul calls it, the perfection of political relations. It's actually the, I mean, political relations under capital or political emancipation is taken to its limit. And communism is actually the step beyond that. And so it's it's sort of, it's interesting to me that the thing about anti-politics is that it actually operates, it seems like it's a negation of the political sphere, but like, all nega- like, like you know, the classical negation, the, there's the negation of, the, it's like the negation of the negation. It's not, refusalism is probably like negation, whereas negation of the negation is, literally this impingement of the negative force, which is the social, upon the operation of politics. And the thing about this is that when you look at all the gains, it's like even when the left like likes to talk about the workers' movement being responsible for the gains achieved, I mean, what does it really mean by that, except that it's the social imposing itself upon the terms of politics that actually forces the political sphere into making, into taking into account or having to organise itself around social interests that it would otherwise not take into account? and not have to be responsive to. And I think that's a, I think that fundamental point is really important to drive home because it's not actually a, a gotcha moment that, oh, you, well, you're actually just doing politics. It's like, well, no, actually, the whole point of politics is to try and act as representation, quote unquote, of, of a social movement or a social base that 
can achieve power through the political sphere. Right. I mean, if you're if you're representing something, uh, you're you're not it, which actually kind of reverses a great line Marx has in uh, I think it's the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right about the bureaucracy, which um, he's saying like the ability to join the bureaucracy does not mean the state is this universal organ not standing over against society. It highlights that you are innately not part of it in itself, right? In the same way that being able to join the clergy doesn't mean Catholicism doesn't stand over against Catholics. I mean, I think it's it's interesting as well that like the very act of like so once it's like that, that the very fact that you cross over into the bureaucracy, it, it's of itself it, it what it does is it, unless it raises the question of, of why that state interest is counterposed to society, even if supposedly, right, you're coming in to make the state social. That's your that's your thinking. Well, it's it's see it just it, it effectively tries to accommodate a disunity as though it could be unified and yet remain disunited at the same time. And it's that problem. I think Tiepel himself talks about this about the that the contradiction for modern political theory is exactly this that it wants to it it it, observe, it understands there's a disunity between the state and, and civil society, and it wants to obtain some kind of unity, but it also wants to preserve that disunity. And so, and, and all its various permutations are about ways of doing that, including, as I've said, up to and including this idea that we'll abolish the state altogether in the sort of the anarchist kind of orientation. And the means to do that is by universalizing po politics, effectively, and which ends up creating, Marx um, writes about this in, um, I forget, what's the name of the... Um, it's got a long name that he critiques uh, Bakunin and uh, Oh my god. So this is actually one of the best critiques of Bakunin that exists, right? But it's buried. It's so buried. It's one of Marx and Engels' um, best writers. I mean, is it, sorry, did Engels... I forget it. Blanking. Did Engels write it, go write it? I think he did, he did, didn't he? Well, it's like got a long committee-sounding name. That's the problem. And it's not on Marxists.org uh, or anything, but it relates to, I think, the ha the Hague, Hog, whatever. I'm, I don't... Hague. Yeah, the Hague Conference, right? And it's when Marx is basically denouncing Bakunin's, like, political conspiracy. And I wanted to actually weigh in on what David was saying, where he was saying, look, this isn't, this isn't actually some new gospel that we're presenting because we've discovered the secret real Marx, right? It's actually, there's an interesting, because of the period of mass politics, you lose to history how much actually the early socialists had read, I mean, and this is even before all of these Marx texts were available to us, and they had an understanding of this stuff. So from Rosa Luxemburg's Reformer Revolution, she says in the section called Capitalism and the State, she says, it has become a commonplace to say that the present state is a class state. This too, like everything referring to capitalist society, should not be understood in a rigorous, absolute manner, but dialectically. She says that capitalist development prepares the return of the function of the state to society. She, she talks about how the state becomes capitalist with the political victory of the bourgeoisie. And she says then that it assumes functions favoring social development specifically because and in the measure that these interests in social development coincide with the interests of the dominant class. But, and this is where she complicates the class state narrative that the left loves, you know, all oh, the capitalists just run the state as if there is no antagonism between the capitalist class and its state, right? This harmony endures only up to a certain point of capitalist development. When capitalist development has reached a certain level, the interests of the bourgeoisie as a class and the needs of economic progress begin to clash even in the capitalist sense. We believe that this phase has already begun. She then goes on to say that the production relations of capitalist society approach more and more the production relations of socialist society. But on the other hand, its political and juridical relations established between capitalist society and socialist society a steadily rising wall. This wall is not overthrown, but is on the contrary strengthened and consolidated by the development of social reforms and the course of a democracy. Only the hammer blow of the revolution, that is to say, the conquest of political power by the proletariat, can break down this wall, right? That is crystal clear. 
about the social political di division, there's other parts in the mass strike, which is a totally slandered work. There's parts in the mass strike that are about the relationship between the economic and political struggle. I mean, her view on it is informed by her social position as part of the leadership of a socialist party that is political in nature. But she's – I think she's really more the heir to Marx's thought on the matter than Lenin, and even Lenin has thoughts about the social-political distinction. To me, when I read it, like, you know, the Tipo book, it, it really stood out to me how – how long am I – do I consider myself a Marxist? Eight or nine years or something like that. When I read it, it was nearly the first time I ever heard it that came across that concept of, like – the unity of the individual and the uh, and the collective in you know in this totality that gets rid of polit the political sphere you know gets rid of this this like you know disassociated you know astral plane. Well, well, this is the thing: is what actually it, it actually prevents the appreciation. I think to some degree, like any politics actually is enhanced my appreciation for the brilliance of what Lenin actually achieves uh, in political terms in the state and revolution. Basically, Lenin, to say that Lenin is probably, like, is the greatest political revolutionary of the 20th century, in some sense, with the way in which Grant and I would, would use the word political, might seem backhanded. But it's actually, like, it also, it, it brings real admiration in the sense that to be able to, to be able to work out of, or achieve a communist version of this effort in modern political theory to retain both the disunity between state and society and inside the unity that's posited. It's actually like, I mean, it's really quite brilliant because it was not obvious how this would be done. And so Lenin's state and revolution is a sort of a, um, it's, a, you know, it's a, it's, it's a genius work. Of, uh, it's a genius work of, of political theory, you know, and, it, it, what's fascinating too is that the question that he's that this is the thing is that you know, I can't really put it, I, I think it's, it's just a there's just a, a certain impoverishment of understanding which I even me myself in terms of the way in which I used to receive it if you don't really grasp that what Lenin's trying to work with here is how in hell do I deal with the only way it seems that you can preserve a socialist revolution which is through the state and this anti-political social dimension which in actual fact, is the revolution itself, and it's it's interesting because his solution, and, and and it's in the context too of responding to the complete collapse and failure of the SPD and of Kautskyism's approach to this question as well. And I think I mean I, I, it's something that I've actually sort of been working on, but and, uh, and I sort of like it's kind of too involved to go in here. But I would actually argue that the Kautsky Lenin Luxembourg. And eventually, like say Gramsci and um, Bodega, all of them actually have some kind of response to this question. So this is not actually something, though. Though you want to go drifting through their works and finding that you know the literal expression that they're responding to the anti-political, you will find across all of them this question of the conquest of politics and about how to deal and the, and the relationship between the social and a political sphere slash state that stands over and against it. It's there. It's there to be. It's there clearly to be seen. Well, well, you're not. You're not supposed to read these. They're Hegelian, right? And when people when people tell you that they're Hegelian, the funny thing is, and Tiepel talks about this. When people tell you these texts are Hegelian, they never define their terms. They never. When they talk about you know Marx as radical, you know humanist or whatever, these are just things, right, that are said about a lot of these works which are foundational, right? Because Marx doesn't even come to the critique of political economy without the critique of politics. Their terms are, are never defined when they say this, right? You know, it's, it's, you know, oh, well, participating in critique of Hegel is participating in Hegelianism. Okay, well, is participating in critique of Lenin, Leninism? I mean, what, what does that even mean, right? The fascinating thing about the early Marx I mean, even the fact that we sort of refer to it as the early Marx, I mean, there's a reality, I think, that to, to that in the sense that Marx actually, what I like about the Tipo book particularly is the way in which, uh, and in fact, I might even quote him here if I could find it. Tipo says, by analysing the content and method of the texts themselves, which is referring to the early works between 1842 and 1847, 
we can point to an unmistakable continuity in Marx's critique of politics, in which each step not only forms a logical link in its development, but also in Marx's eyes remains valid in itself. And this is that's what I like so much, and I think it extends across the course of his whole life, which is that it's not the case that he doesn't change, which I think is oftentimes what's treated as being like, as if there's this, this like, I don't know, like that Marx sort of like gives birth fully formed to um, the, his ultimate understanding of both capitalism and, you know, the attainment of communism. But rather what he does is that he proceeds step by step and there remains, and that there's a, there's this, there's a continuity which, or a growing kind of like expanding circle that takes him through the critique of politics. Well, first of all, through critiquing politics within its own terms, as Tebow talks talks about, then beyond that to the critique of politics. And then, not so much as beyond that, but as the actual necessary basis by which the critique of politics finds its causes, moves on to the critique of political economy. Because the fundamental nature of both the need and necessity and the very limit that politics poses resides in political economy. Right. Tipo says, by examining the nature of the separation of executive from society, the essence of politics, Marx discovered that the separation was a consequence of the particularistic nature of civil society. Hence, this civil society, this nature of civil society was the cause, the reason for the separation of the state and its members. The nature of the methodological dynamic may not be immediately recognizable, but it becomes apparent in the next step. The cause of the separation of political relations was found to rest in the nature of civil society, the chief characteristic of which Marx grasped in the critique as private property. Private property was the principle of civil society. But while this revelation explained political relations, it was not in any sense self-explanatory. And that's where, that's the, exactly it. That's the point at which the critique of politics, because the thing is, it technically would be possible to critique politics without being able to, uh, or without it, looking at private property and deriving its, or treating it as self-explanatory. And in fact, many ways, the whole logic of political critique does this. So in other words, if you're engaging, if you're engaging in a critique of politics that doesn't take the step beyond, in some sense, you really actually haven't achieved a critique of politics itself. You're engaged in, you know, political theory, modern political critique. I, I think it, in the last chapter, particularly, as Tipo actually points out, that, that Hegel, for example, right, in some sense engages in a kind of critique of politics, but reaches the limit in the very form of not being able to interrogate the basis of the civil social state split in the first place. And from that point onwards, I think what Marx then devotes himself to is trying to understand or trying to be able to provide the actual clarity about what steps need to be taken to transform the actual relations of civil society in a way that that provides the basis by which capitalism is supersedable as a mode of production. He's, he's actually, I mean, in some ways, like it's studying capital to, to the close technical extent and degree that he does. Marx is really trying to f- focus in on, in the most concrete way possible, what are the material fundamentals of capital which will need to be transformed in order for for social emancipation to be achieved and inherently for politics to be overturned as otherwise the only means to try and, you know, sort out social antagonisms. And I think that it's like, it's it's, I think it's also important too, because what it gets at is that a lot of the, uh, what uh, the, the change really that communism would involve is as much about the way in which we interrelate in civil society quote unquote, in other words, about the civil nature. In some sense, civil uh, civility is a modality, it's a modalization of society. So basically the way in which we'd associate is sort of integral to the question of what communism is. And it's not just like, like in other words, to, to try and plot out from the perspective of the state a kind of architecture of what the socialist society looks like gets things back to front because it's from the transformed associational relations that the architecture of a social economy emerges. I think that, I think you, you kind of really sort of begin to grasp the, the, how this sort of might work or how it might operate in the sense that the way in which freedom in production is so uh, central 
what Marx's focus is and the way in which administration the administration of things, it, uh, it, the idea of, of like administrators, administrators being tethered to labour is exactly to do with the administration of free association in production. That it's the it, it, the administration of things or the idea of uh, the, the almost intuitive sense we all have that there has to be some sort of organisational institutional edifice of some kind that, that, that through which that mediates and orchestrates the conduct of social relations. It's only administrative if it's attached to an extensive of free association and production. If it's not, then fundamentally it's going to reproduce the the split between state and society or politics and um, the social. On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode, From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist research and podcast collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit and Swampside Chats, 